Hello everybody. Here is lesson 2 for the second week. As part of the backgrounds to the English Romantics 1798 to 1832, we will be today looking at Descent and Revolution. So, the Romantic period in literature traditionally given over in our understanding, traditional understanding to nature and sentiment was also interested in science as we have seen before in our earlier lessons. It was interested in uh, things like empire and imperial conquest and the cultural other. But it also was a period of considerable turbulence. The French Revolution 1789 culminating in Napoleon's coup of 1799 was at the opening moments of the English Romantic period traditionally speaking. So, the French Revolution and its aftermath had its reverberations in England's political culture and in its literature. The English poets notably Wordsworth and Coleridge were at least initially major supporters of the revolution and they wrote about it. We will see some examples. Wordsworth had a personal connection of course uh, with France as well. He had visited France during the revolutionary years, met Annette Vallon and had a daughter by her. Wordsworth would describe England in 1802 as quote a fen of waters and call upon Milton to return to give the English manners, virtue, freedom, power. That is Wordsworth. He requests Milton to come back to teach English, the English people manners, virtue, freedom and power. When Edmund Burke, statesman, published his reflections on the revolution in France 1790, he argued that if such a revolution ever occurred in England, it would end Britain's wonderful traditional institutions and result as he said in anarchy. Take a look at this text from slide 1. This is a famous poem, The Mask of Anarchy, written on the occasion of the massacre at Manchester by Percy Shelley. I would urge you to take a close look at this poem, which is on the website given to you at the end, at the foot of the slide. This was a key text. The Mask of Anarchy is a key text. Uh, you will, as the lesson progresses, see several more. I will mention a couple right away. Other influential texts included William Godwin's Inquiry into Political Justice, 1793, and Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. As a result of the revolution and the deeply polarized debates, such as the ones we have just seen, literature and intellectual writings were consistently political in nature. So, on the one hand, there is conservative Burke who said, oh my God, what happens if revolutions such as the French come to England? And then there is someone like Shelley who is saying, well, we do need some revolution. And Wordsworth and Coleridge initially big supporters of the French Revolution. We will look at Wordsworth in a while. The revolution represented for many of the English writers a new beginning, a new social order change. Here is slide 2, which is an image for, by Richard Carlyle, painting of the Peterloo massacre. There is a URL uh, at the foot of the slide as always. So, please take a look at this uh, massacre, which was documented and utilized n number of times by the literary uh, scholars of that time. So, here is Wordsworth erupting in joy at the idea of a revolution. This is from the prelude and what you have are two consecutive slides on from Wordsworth's prelude. Please read that carefully. Oh, pleasant exercise of hope and joy. For mighty were the auxiliars which then stood upon our side, we who were strong in love. And then his famous praise. Bliss was it in the dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. The most quoted lines from the prelude. Bliss was it in the dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. O oh, times in which the meagre, stale, forbidding ways of custom, law and statute took at once the attraction of a country in romance. When reason seemed the most to assert her rights, when most intent on making of herself a prime enchantress to assist the work which then was going forward in her name. Not favoured spots alone, but the whole earth, the beauty war of promise, that which sets as it some moment might not be unfelt among the bowers of paradise itself. They who had fed their childhood upon dreams, the playfellows of fancy, who had made all powers of swiftness, subtlety and strength their ministers, who in lordly wise had stirred among the grandest objects of the sense and dealt with whatsoever they found there, as if they had within some lurking right to wield it. Note this, Wordsworth is enthusiastic, he is welcoming the revolution and he does not think of it as utopia, not in utopia he says, subterranean fields or some secreted island, heaven knows where, but in the very world which is the world of all of us. In other words, Wordsworth is not speculating on a revolution somewhere out there, somewhere in the distant uh, geographically and temporally distant place. He is talking about a revolution here. Look at what he is saying, in the very world which is the world of all of us, the place where in the end 
we find our happiness or not at all. Second example, coming up on your screens, slide, the next slide from Coleridge in France and Ode. This is Coleridge. This is what he says. When France in wrath her giant limbs upreared, and with that oath which smote air, earth, and sea, stamped her strong foot and said she would be free, bear witness for me how I hoped and feared. Now you see, there is a sense of ambivalence that Coleridge is proposing here. It's not just a welcoming interest and passion for the revolution. There's an anxiety that things may not go as planned, which is why I, how I hoped and feared. And the exact opposite, the contrary to uh, what we have just seen from Wordsworth and Coleridge, Edmund Burke on the possible dangers of revolutionary ideals crossing over into England. Your next two slides. This is Burke. Reflections on the revolution in France, and this is what he says. You will smile here at the consistency of those democratists who, when they are not on their guard, treat the humbler part of the community with the greatest contempt, whilst at the same time, they pretend to make them in the depositories of all power. This is what he says. Kings will be tyrants by policy when subjects are rebels from principle. And then a rather extended quotation, but I think um, a crucial one, again from Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. Please read this carefully. And what he's saying is he's nostalgic about the Queen of France. He says, it's now 16 or 17 years that I have seen her and she's full of life and splendor and joy. And then he says, what a revolution. And what is it that now I experience? And then he says, I thought 10,000 swords must have leaped from the scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. He says, I do not know but perhaps 10,000 swords would have jumped up in her defense. Never more, never, never, he says, shall we behold that generous loyalty to rank and sex, that proud submission, that dignified obedience, that subordination of the heart which kept alive, even in servitude itself, the spirit of an exalted freedom, the unbought grace of life, the cheap defense of nations, the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise is gone. What's Burke doing here? Burke is mourning the loss of a traditional system of values. He's mourning the collapse of traditional ways of thinking, of hierarchies, of social order. And look at what he's saying. The chastity of honor has been stained and that ought to have inspired courage. But look at these people when I mean, he's referring to the French. But you see, throughout the re reflections on, upon a revolution in France, Burke is worrying that a similar situation might arise in England. He's worrying that all those things that were happening will cause a collapse of the social order. Basically what he's saying is the aristocrats will stand to lose their elite status, their power, their wealth, and of course their uh, ability to oppress other people. Later with the Napoleonic Wars, which ended with Waterloo in June 1815, debates about the economic and social costs of extended wars were also reflected. And Wordsworth's poems therefore detail the life of the discharged soldier. And I already mentioned in an earlier lesson, Blake's soldier who now has come back from the war, is injured, and he hates monarchy, the palace, and that the palace basically the institution of monarchy which sent him to war and has caused this kind of damage and has given him nothing in turn. Look at your next slide. This is something you need to also pay attention to that Coleridge is speaking about the possible invasion of England itself. That is, just as Burke is beginning to, in his reflections on the revolution in France, worrying that there is imminent revolution in England, Coleridge in Fears and Solitude is also saying this. It weighs upon the heart that he must think what uproar and what strife may now be stirring this way or that way over the silent hills, invasion, and the thunder and the shout and all the crash of onset, fear and rage and undetermined conflict even now, even now perchance and in his native isle, carnage and groans beneath this blessed sun. Having looked at some of these poets, Let's take a look at what Tom Paine would say in Rights of Man. Now you see what you can document very easily from what we have said so far is the two opposing views about the revolution. Wordsworth and Coleridge initially welcoming of it, but Coleridge as we have just seen in the except from fears in solitude, the anxiety that this invasion will come to their what he calls native isle, to their quiet island. But this is Tom Paine on the Rights of Man who is saying that what are the present garments of Europe? 
he asks, and I quote here, it's up on your slide, please take a look at it. What are the present governments of Europe? And he says, they are a scene of iniquity and oppression. What is that of England? And he says, do not its own inhabitants say it is a market where every man has its price and where corruption is common traffic at the expense of a deluded people. No wonder then that the French Revolution is traduced. He's arguing that England is also ready for a revolution because its government is practically just the same. Social inequalities, decreasing employment, food scarcity, all of which began to accumulate towards the first decades of the 19th century. And the people began to ask these questions, what are we doing with all these wars when our own country is suffering? Here is Percy Shelley in his uh, well-known sensational England in 1819. Up on your slide next. Look at that description. An old, mad, blind, despised and dying king. Princes the dregs of their dull race. The princes are no longer aristocrats. They're no longer elite looked up to. They're the dregs of their race who flow through public scorn. The public now hates the princes. And then he describes how the people are. A people starved and stabbed in the untilled field. An army which liberticide and prey makes as a two-edged sword to all who wield. Then he says, all of these, he hopes these graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. Shelley is attacking English monarchy here. Rulers who can neither see nor feel nor know is how he puts it. Rulers who neither see nor feel nor know. Its institutions such as the church and politics are all the same. So monarchy, the church and politics are all just the same. Shelley's other poems such as The Mask of Anarchy, which I urge you to look at in my opening slide, were equally harsh critiques of the British political culture. Blake's London mounted a savage attack on monarchy, the church, the commercial business class. So as you can see, these poets were all extremely anxious, angry, upset at what was going on but they were equally upset and unhappy about what was going on in England. In Wordsworth's The French Revolution at its commencement, which was later incorporated into the prelude, he would um, express hope and joy. And he would say that perhaps it's time we have another kind of government, a more socially relevant one. The point you need to understand is that there were other forms of dissent as well, not just against monarchy, but against, say, religious principles. Blake starts this with the marriage of heaven and hell and his songs of innocence and experience where he began to speak against religion. But this is also Percy Shelley's famous The Necessity of Atheism, which like Blake's work was in, an interrogation of the religious discourse of the time. In his human abstract um, from the songs of experience, Blake would make a huge point and he would make the point about our quote unquote noble virtues. Here as your concluding slide is William Blake the human abstract. Pity would be no more if we did not make somebody poor. And mercy no more could be if all were as happy as we. And mutual fear brings peace till the selfish loves increase. Then cruelty knits a snare and spreads his baits with care. When the poem concludes, he says, the gods of the earth and sea sought through nature to find this tree. Sought through nature to find this tree. But note what I've already said about the binary between nature and culture. And he says, the search was all in vain there grows one in the human brain. What Blake is doing is to say that it's not only in nature that there's cruelty, but it's not that the human person, the human mind or the human emotional component that is about charity and mercy and pity only. What he's saying is something horrific. You cannot show pity unless you keep somebody poor. You cannot show mercy if everybody is equally happy. In other words, what Blake is revealing is the hypocrisy behind our so-called virtues. What he's saying is all our virtues are actually attempts at masking social inequities. So think of the range of topics we have covered today. The idea of dissent and revolution, but also dissent in the form of what we have just seen in Blake, where he's arguing that let's not think of human, the human components of emotion or intellect as being all about good and virtue and, and virtue. It's also about social inequalities. It's this kind of dynamics and this kind of tension about dissent that informs the English romantics. Thank you.